This wonderful Jesus was perfect, and he could do anything. He was God. They finally came to explain the betrayal by Judas and the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Judas' betrayal was upsetting to the most, but they still had faith that somehow Jesus would escape. That was the last story we told them before the gospel presentation. At the end of it, we said, Tomorrow we will finish our talk. The next morning, the people were all gathered before sunrise. I told the story of Jesus appearing before Pilate. The people were very sober. When during our skit they saw Jesus being spit upon, beaten, and finally put to death, they were simply appalled. They were distraught. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Because the death and shedding of blood is so significant to the gospel story, we had rigged a balloon filled with colored water to be pierced by our designated Roman soldier. It was when they saw the blood that the story began to take on significance. Our explanation and portrayal of Jesus Christ's resurrection was simple, but to them, very powerful. The Savior was alive. Then I went back into the Old Testament stories and beginning with Abel, explained how Jesus was our acceptable sacrifice, just like Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God. When I finally reached the story of Abraham and Isaac, I said to them, Listen, just as a real lamb was substituted for Isaac, so Christ's death and blood has been shed as a substitution for you. At that point, the lights really went on. I could see and hear them responding all over the crowd. I believe! I believe! I believe! I stood in their midst and asked them what they thought. From all over, responses came like this. I know I was born in sin. I believe Jesus paid for my sin, that he died in my place. He is my sin bearer. I lived in fear trying to please the spirits, for I knew no other way to be free from sin. But God in his grace has sent you to us. I've heard it and believe the death and blood of Christ is payment for my sin. I believe it and God has forgiven me. On that day, almost all the village expressed belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a sense of tremendous relief. The Mok are generally a restrained people, but as the gospel sunk in and new believers sensed the liberation from sin, spontaneous rejoicing broke out. Watch what happened. <laughs> Village believers stating that he too believes that Christ has paid for his sins. Itao, which means it's true or it's good, it's very true. Village grammar rejoicing that he believes, so does she. Different ones giving testimony as to their belief in Christ as their sin bearer. Mark saying that if they really are believing, then God's word says that their sin is forgiven. Itao, it's good, it's true. Spontaneous rejoicing breaks out. This went on for two and a half hours.
You know, we had a sort of a heavy relationship, my mum and dad, and I never really got on with my father. And he was absent most of my life, actually, either drunk or having some affair, just awful. And then when I became a Christian, I wanted a relationship with my dad. I wanted him back in my life. I had to track him down, which I did, and he was living in a, a pensioner's flat in Macclesfield on his own. You know, I thought he'd have changed like I did. He hadn't. He was grumpier. He was older. He was drinking more. He was just vulgar, crude, you know, sarcastic. And he's exactly what I remembered. And I invited him down to our house, to our home in, in London. And he'd get the train down and I'd meet him at Euston Station. And every time I'd meet him on, on the platform, I'd go and get him when he was coming off. He'd be whinging and moaning and complaining and slightly drunk. And one of the things he used to whinge about all the time was money. And then one day he came to stay and he'd, um, he got quite poorly and had to go to the local hospital. Ended up staying for a week. It was a nightmare. Um, and I wanted to get him back home when he was better. So we took him to Euston Station and I put him on the train uh, and sat him down. And right in the middle of the carriage, I had this overwhelming feeling of love for my dad and it was really weird. And I almost started to cry in the carriage and I looked at him and I felt really sad for him that we'd never had a relationship. I don't ever remember eating a meal with my father. All that stuff came up for me. And in my mind came this idea to upgrade his ticket to a first class ticket to Manchester. And, and I bought a very expensive single uh, first-class ticket back to Manchester and I walked him into the first-class compartment and I sat him down and I kissed him on the head and as we stood on the platform Amanda said to me what on earth are you doing I said you know what I have no idea I just really wanted to see my dad happy and as I looked at him through through the window of, of the carriage I saw my father take his trilby off, he always wore a hat, take his trilby off and put it on the table. He hit the, the recline button and sort of bent back in the, the leather seat. And then he clicked his fingers and some of the waiters brought him a cup of tea and some biscuits. And then he got his newspaper out and started to read it. And as he was doing that, he just turned to look at me out of the window. And he had the biggest smile on his face that you could ever see. It's like every birthday and every Christmas had all come together. And he was beaming. And that was the last time that I ever saw my father. Three weeks later, he died of a, a, a massive heart attack on his own in that pensioner's flat. Now I always think, was that me just making up an idea that I thought I might buy him a ticket? Or was that God guiding me? I have a real peace with my father through all those years of, of arguments and fighting and drinking and womanizing and, and, and just awful stuff. The only image I've got of my father is that picture of his face looking through that railway carriage as it drove off. Medina lives in Iran, and this is her story. As a child, I started to recite the daily prayer. Before I would go to school, I would memorize the Quran. I hated Christians. I became very happy when I heard about Christians being persecuted. They always told us that if we killed a Christian, we had a one-way ticket to heaven. 
I worked very hard to follow every rule of Islam. If I thought I hadn't washed correctly, I would stop in the middle of my prayers, wash correctly, and start all over again. This would happen ten times in one prayer session. I became very depressed and suicidal. I felt so distant from Allah, and my mom was very sick and dying. I said to my mom, I am going to kill myself. If you are going to kill yourself, you have to kill me as well. I said, I will do this for you, and we will both die. My brothers and sisters, I'm with you tonight. The Lord has a special message for you tonight. If you're hopeless, if you're oppressed, if you're planning to commit suicide, the Lord says stop. He has a hope and a future for you. If you're planning to kill yourself, stop and call me. She spoke to him for a half an hour. I said, I'm going to do this. Nothing is going to stop me tonight. I saw that my mom was repenting and doing the prayer of salvation. I became furious. Why in the last seconds of your life did you do this? Now you're going to go to hell. Please, Padina. Please talk to him about Jesus. Jesus can do nothing. Jesus is nothing. I will not blaspheme Muhammad by speaking to this infidel. <laughs> When I talked to her, she was cold, she was fighting, and she told me very proudly, I'm going to kill myself, and your Jesus cannot do anything for me. After about an hour of argument with her, uh, and I couldn't change her mind. I just want to die. You said it yourself. Allah has done nothing for you. Give Jesus just one chance. You can always kill yourself next week. When he gave me this challenge, I thought, this is the best way I can serve Allah. This one last time before I commit suicide. I was thinking, okay, I'll pray. And next week, this time, Jesus had not done anything for me. I call uh, live on the air and I tell everybody, look, I tried Jesus for a week and nothing has changed. And I'm going to kill myself tonight. And I would do it on the air. When I kill myself on this live program, I can say to Allah, even taking my life was for you. Early the next morning, I was awakened by a sound. I saw my mother walking, and she was walking perfectly. I told her we needed to go to the hospital immediately. The doctor checked the results of the blood work and the MRI. They said, this is a miracle. There is no MS in her body. That's not possible. Something must be wrong. No, this is a miracle. What imam did you pray to? What imam did you pray to? It wasn't an imam. It was Jesus. Jesus. When I said those words, My heart changed. I told Jesus, you are the living God. You cleansed me and filled me. I'll give up my life for you. Today, Badina and her mother are apostates. They risk their lives in ministering in Iran's underground church. This is the first time we have been 
In the primary school, we were taught that all missionaries were terrorists. They told us that a missionary will be nice to you at first, but when they get you into their homes, then they will kill you and eat your liver. There was no food and no work in my village. Like some others, I snuck across the mountain border into China. I picked mushrooms in the hopes of selling them in Chiang Mai. I don't speak Chinese at all. But in the mountains, I met a man. He said, I can sell those for you. And he didn't cheat me. He gave me all the money from the sale. At that time, I didn't know he was Pastor Han. Over the next two years, I went back several times. Each time, Pastor Han helped me. One day, I asked why he would do this, for he himself was in great danger for assisting a North Korean. It is because I am a Christian, he said. That made me afraid. Was he going to eat my liver? One day, Pastor Han said to me, God is real. There is hope for every person. I could not believe he would say that word. God, nobody says that word. We know it is an act of treason. To speak the name of God can lead to soldiers coming in the night. Journalists will write about you, and no one will ever dare ask where you have gone. One day I asked Pastor Han for a Bible. He knew that if I was caught with a Bible, my life would be in danger. But over time, I persuaded him. I showed the Bible to my wife. At first, she refused to even look at it. Why would you bring that here, she cried. She knew that if anyone reported that you had even glanced at a Bible, you would be arrested, and not just you. You and all your relatives sent to the concentration camps for years and years and years. Over time, my wife too learned that God is real. She found hope. And then I shared the word of God with my best friend. It was very dangerous for me to share. It was very dangerous for him to listen. Mm -hmm. 
one day in the summer of 2016, we heard that some North Korean assassins were being honored by the government, rewarded for their good work for killing a terrorist missionary in Chiang Mai. We knew it was Pastor Han. Who else could it be? We were frightened. Did they know he was my friend? Did they know I had met with him many times? Pastor Han gave his life, but he gave hope to me and to many other North Koreans. And despite the ever-present danger, Many of us will continue to share the message that God is real. We hope that our sacrifice, when the day comes, will be worthwhile, just like it was for Pastor Han. I want to tell you a story. I used to believe that Jesus was a Catholic God, God of the Gentiles. I imagined that Jesus was Italian. The New Testament was one of those books that I saw nuns reading on the subway. I was expecting to find a handbook on how to persecute the Jews. I'm reading a story written by Jews about Jewish people. One thing you don't do is you don't talk about Jesus. I'm gonna get ostracized. I'm gonna, they're gonna think I'm crazy. And are you out of your mind? You're not Jewish anymore. Absolutely not. Do not look into this. You are a traitor to your people. Jesus was the Messiah. He wants relationship. He wants fellowship. Believing in Jesus is the most Jewish thing I can do. I mean, to have a close relationship with God, the truth is worth it. Life with, with Yeshua would be worth it. Here's what you need to do. You've got to first shave your head. You dress all in black. You've got to wear a white robe, eat only kosher foods. You've got to become a vegetarian. You face Jerusalem. You've got to face India when you pray. You pray only in Hebrew, and you grow a nice big beard. And if you do all of those outward cultural things, you'll discover the God of the universe. And I'm thinking this is crazy that someone thinks that they can force their culture on God and that God's going to be impressed by what you wear, what direction you face when you pray, what you eat, and all these sorts of things. It seemed to me that if there was a God out there who could be known, he should be able to be recognized no matter where I face, no matter how I'm dressed, because he's God. Growing up, we always understood that we had our Bible and the Gentiles had their Bible, the New Testament, and that they were two completely separate books. Because the only people I knew who were believers in Jesus were all people in our public school who were Italian Catholic, I imagined that Jesus was Italian. And so the understanding that he's actually Jewish was, was a shock. And then to hear that the New Testament was written by Jews, I, I couldn't believe it. My expectation was that the New Testament was like my grandparents had told me. It was a, a book on how to persecute the Jews and something you should stay away from. Of course, when you're told you should stay away from something, <laughs> curiosity gets the best of you and you've got to see it. When I opened the New Testament, I was expecting to find a handbook on how to persecute the Jews. My grandparents had warned me that it was written by people who killed the Jews. That's what I was expecting to see, and yet when I'm opening it, I'm reading a story written by Jews about Jewish people. The New Testament was a fascinating book. And so as I opened this book in the library, I kind of looked around, made sure that none of my friends had seen me taking a Christian Bible off the shelf. And I open it, here's the first sentence. 
It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So three people are mentioned and they're all Jewish. I was very shocked. And as I continue to read, I'm reading the story of a Jewish man who was born in a Jewish village, in a Jewish country, and one day walks into a synagogue and announces that he is the Messiah. The more I read the words of Jesus, the more I became attracted to him. It was as beautiful as anything I had ever read in any other part of the Bible. As I came to faith that Yeshua, that Jesus was the Messiah, it was clear that that was the most Jewish thing I could do. This is not a person who's a renegade to our people. This is the one who was promised in our Bible, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It is astonishing. If you would just read that chapter, just without the Bible being around it, you would say, oh, this is some Christian Bible. This is Jesus. <laughs> when you realize, though, that it's in the middle of our Bible, our Jewish Bible. When I first came to faith, I dared not tell my father, uh, because this is a time period in the, the 1970s when there were lots of gurus and cults. And he was very concerned about me getting involved in some crazy sect and going off someplace. So I waited for months. And uh, when I finally told him, he was very skeptical. On his own then, he started to read about Jesus as well. About a year and a half later, I told him that the fellow who wrote one of the books that he had read, that this fellow was giving a lecture in the city of New York. And he agreed to come out to hear that person. And uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life was, the speaker said, would everyone here who is a Jewish believer in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I raised my hand. My father also raised his hand. And I said, I looked over, I said, Pop, he didn't say would all the Jews raise their hand. He said, would all the Jewish believers in Jesus raise their hand? And my father looked over and he said, yes, I, I heard what he said. The decision to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah was not something that was a momentary lark. It wasn't something that was a passing fad. And I could see changes in myself that I knew were not from within myself. I had kind of tapped in to a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful.